In this video, we're going to jump into communicable diseases. We're going to go over a few of them as well as how they can be prevented. Welcome to CASRN, where I teach you about all things nursing. So communicable disease is a disease that is spread from one person to another. And we're going to review a little bit the chain of infection, which I'm sure you remember from your biology and microbiology classes. But essentially, we're going to start with an agent. And this is the thing that is the disease. It's going to be collected in a reservoir of some sort. This can be another human. This can be stagnant water. This can be a tabletop, anything like that, where it's just going to hang out and survive. Then it's going to figure out how to exit that portal, that reservoir, it's going to have a portal of exit for something like COVID, for example, that can be sneezing and then it can be in the air droplets. Then we've got the transmission and how it go goes from one person to another. And then the portal of entry is how it's going to get inside a susceptible host now, bacteria and virus can get inside a human, but their body can fight it off before we have any kind of symptoms or illness. So that person has to be susceptible. The people that are going to be most susceptible to communicable diseases are the elderly, the young, and the people with immune problems. Now, reportable diseases are diseases that are reported to the local and state health departments and then on to the CDC. This is optional. Not every state reports to the CDC, but this is really valuable because this is where we get our data and statistics for communicable diseases so we can track outbreaks and what's going on in certain areas. Now, the goal of the community health nurse is to reduce the spread of those communicable diseases. When I was getting my first bachelor's degree, which is in community health, one of our professors would always state that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When you think about that, it's very true because think about preventing cancer. If you're able to go into those screenings and prevent it before it gets bad, then that is worth the long-term treatment options that are available, or if you get an immunization such as in primary prevention, and then you never actually get a disease, think how much better it was to get that one immunization that costs a few dollars versus getting the treatment and being hospitalized for some sort of disease that was completely preventable. Now we're going to go through the primary well, the different types of prevention. So first off, we've got primary pre prevention. And I know that this is kind of confusing for a lot of people who are unfamiliar with this, but primary, when you think about it, think of going to your primary care doctor where you go every year to get your physicals. This is stopping a disease before it starts. So the purpose of going to your primary care doctor is to prevent an illness before it starts. This is going to be something like immunizations, education and counseling, such as reducing risky behavior, washing your hands, having safer sex. And I say that in that anytime you have sex, there's a risk of an STD getting passed, but we can use condoms, which will help reduce the risk. So it's called safer sex, proper food handling, and then evidence-based practice, which is really important. This is, I talked about this in my previous video, but essentially evidence-based practice is going through and using all the appropriate data and using material that has been proven to reduce risk. Secondary prevention is catching a disease before it causes damage or before the signs and symptoms begin. So primary prevention is when it doesn't exist at all inside the body yet. Secondary prevention is when it does exist, but we're catching it before those early signs and symptoms. So this is going to be things like health screenings, such as in health fairs, this is post-exposure prophylaxis, such as getting a rabies shot after being bitten by a rabid animal. This is contact tracing, like you're seeing right now with COVID or with STIs. And this is also going to be something like maybe getting a pap smear because they're going to detect those cancer cells. They're already in the body, but then you can go in and get a minimal treatment rather than extensive treatment, such as in tertiary prevention, 
So tertiary prevention is to reduce the complications or the damage due to the disease process. So the damage is already done essentially, but we want to reduce it. So this is going to be just treatment, rehabbing, and then community resource referrals to those that might need it. Now we're going to go through a few of the diseases. Uh, now, a disease is a disorder or function or structure that produces specific signs or symptoms or that affects a specific location and is not simply a direct result of physical injury. Uh, most of this information I got from the CDC, so there's the website to it. Feel free to go ahead and, and explore more if you so choose. We're going to start off by going through the sexually transmitted infections. So we've got HIV, hepatitis, herpes, and HPV. Chlamydia, syphilis, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis. So something that I learned when I did this, my job before deciding to go to nursing school was a health educator, and I taught teen pregnancy prevention and healthy relationships. And part of that was a comprehensive sex ed program. And these are the majority of the STDs that we went through. There's a few other smaller ones out there, but they're not as pertinent. Uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea are definitely the most common, at least in my area. Now, HIV, hepatitis, herpes, and HPV, I don't know how this worked out, but those are all the viral ones. So if it starts with an H, it's a virus, which obviously changes our treatment plan. Then the rest of them are bacterial, and trichomoniasis is actually a protozoa, so it's a, a different thing altogether, but it's not a virus, and we're going to go through a few of those really quick, really quickly. HIV is a direct contact virus. So this means direct contact with someone who's infected with semen, blood, vaginal fluids, breast milk, or rectal fluids. So the prevention there is going to be the body substance isolation. So that's going to be wearing gloves when coming in contact with blood, wearing condoms when having sex, and then education is also very important. The signs and symptoms, as you can see here, are very similar to having the flu. And a lot of people will have flu-like symptoms when they initially get the virus, but then will recover and be fine because their immune system is able to keep it under control. But after a while, it starts to attack the immune system and that viral load gets really high. And you'll start to see something called opportunistic infections, which are infections that only people who have HIV see like Carposi sarcoma, which is a rare form of cancer. So it's this can actually hide in your body for up to 10 years, and you can not know that you have HIV. So again, as nurses, it's always very important to assume that everybody has some sort of communicable disease and to pre pre protect ourselves as necessary. The treatment for this is something called ART therapy. It's antiretroviral therapy because the virus itself is an anti is a retrovirus. And so we use antiretroviral therapy. We want to monitor the viral load and then, again, watch for those opportunistic infections and treat them accordingly. Hepatitis A and E are both foodborne. And then B, C, and D are direct contact contact prevention. We ha They have vaccinations for A and B, which all of us would have had to get before going to nursing school. And then... D is actually very connected to hepatitis B. So if you get the hepatitis B vaccine, you're not likely to get the hepatitis D. Then, of course, sanitation and safer sex as well, because direct contact for B, C, and D can be transmitted that way. This is going to be something that affects your liver. So you're going to see things like dark urine, fever, fatigue, nausea, jaundice, which makes sense for your liver, joint pain, and vomiting. Now the treatment here is a prophylaxis vaccine and some medications for B and C, but D has no treatment and E usually self-resolves. Herpes is direct contact. This is basically just cold sores. There's two types of herpes. You can get type 1 and type 2. Uh, type 1 is the kind that you usually have around the lips. Type 2 is the kind that is around the genitals, but they can be transmitted during oral sex. So prevention here is going to be abstinence and monogamy, and then again, the safer sex with the condoms. The signs and symptoms are going to be cold sores. I'm sure you've probably seen those, but they're basically just blisters around the mouth or genitals, and then treatment is oral medications. The human papillomavirus is also direct contact. There's a, an immunization for this one now, and abstinence is obviously going to prevent if you don't have sex, you can't get HPV. The signs and symptoms are going to be genital warts for some of the strains, but it can also cause cervical cancer, penile cancer, and then any kind of genital cancer such as anal, vulvar, or vaginal. 
The treatments for this one, again, because it's a virus, there's just some oral medications and then you can get the warts removed. Early diagnosis is the biggest thing with a pap smear or for cervical cancer. Chlamydia is a direct contact as well. Same thing here, abstinence, monogamy, condoms. Then the signs and symptoms here are going to be vaginal discharge, dysuria, penile discharge, rectal discharge, because you can get it in the rectum as well. And this also can cause pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility. This one, for women in particular, it's very hard to know if they have STDs because the entire reproductive system is internal. Men, usually if their penis gets red and swollen, they're going to hopefully seek help for that. Women can't tell so much if that's happening. And so it's really common if it goes untreated to cause this PID and then eventually all the scarring can cause infertility. The treatment for this, because it is a bacteria, is antibiotics for you and your sexual partners. Syphilis is the next one. This is a really interesting bacteria. It's actually shaped kind of like a corkscrew. So while it is initially introduced into the reproductive systems, it can actually affect other body systems because it can corkscrew through the tissue. So this one's a direct contact. Again, same type of prevention as with the other, all the other STIs. Now there's a couple different types of these. The primary phase of syphilis is just going to be firm, round, painless sores. The secondary is going to be like a skin rash and some swollen lymph nodes, maybe a fever, and then it will go latent and there will be no symptoms. So if that doesn't get treated with some antibiotics, and it'll do nothing symptom wise. However, at that point, that's when it's kind of going through, that's when it is going from one body system to the other body system. And then it can get on the tertiary phase. And the tertiary phase is going to be very different because it depends on which organ system it got to, but it can even affect the nervous system. So it can go and affect the brains, the nerves, the blood vessels, the bones, eyes, heart, liver joints, and each of these can cause associated symptoms that can go along with those body systems. If it does get into the nervous system and the brain, it can cause dementia, seizures, and paralysis. So definitely one you want to stay away from and easily treatable with antibiotics. Gonorrhea, again, direct contact, same type of prevention. These signs are going to be usually a dysuria, both in men and women, some discharge, for men, there'd be some painful and swollen testicles. And for women, there can be spotting and bleeding in between periods. This again is an antibiotic. However, some strains are becoming resistant. So it's really important to make sure that you take the medication as prescribed. You make sure your partner takes the medication as prescribed in order to be able to stop that bacteria resistant strains that are starting to come up. This medication as well, or this this bacteria as well, can be passed to a baby during birth. So it's really important that pregnant women get treated because this can cause some blindness and some problems for uh, babies during the birthing process. Next up, we have trichomoniasis, which is actually caused by a protozoan parasite called trichomoniasis vaginalis. 70% of the people who are infected with this actually don't have any symptoms. So this is, again, direct contact, abstinence, monogamy, and condoms. The people who do have symptoms, which is only 30% of people, are going to have discharge, dysuria, and itching, and redness and burning around the genitals. This is also treated with an antibiotic, as you can see here. Okay, now we're moving on to more communicable diseases that are not STIs. So we've got the men meningococcal disease. This again is also direct contact, but we have vaccines for this. And then there's prophylactic antibiotics that can also be given. People will spread meningococcal bacteria to others by sharing respiratory and throat secretions. So like saliva or spit, which generally uh, it takes close or lengthy contact to spread those bacteria, such as coughing and kissing this usually spreads between roommates and people who live in the same house or people that are in close contact with saliva, such as boyfriends, girlfriends, and partners. So people are going to experience fever, headaches, stiff neck, nausea and vomiting, sensitivity to light, and possibly an altered level of consciousness. This is treated with antibiotics, but it's important to get it treated quickly because it can have some long-term effects. 
We've got the mumps, which is transmitted via droplet transmission. There's also a vaccine for this one. The symptoms include, they're very similar to the meningitis, which is fever, headaches, muscle aches, fatigue, and then a loss of appetite. Mumps are viral, so there is no antibiotic treatment, so we actually just look at symptom relief. Pertussis, which is also droplet, it also has a vaccine. And then it has cold-like symptoms. You're going to also have a fever, and then there's going to be violent, rapid coughing, followed by whooping breasts. This is why this is also called the whooping cough. Pertussis and the whooping cough are the same thing because they're going to cough a lot and then they're going to take an inhale and it sounds like a whooping. So look up some videos of what that sounds like and that'll help you uh, understand what pertussis is. And this one is also treated with just antibiotics. Tuberculosis is something that we all get screened for as nurses. This is airborne the only way to prevent it is to avoid contact with infected individuals, and then we do TB screenings as a secondary form of prevention to know if somebody has it or not. The signs and symptoms, again, are going to be respiratory symptoms, right? Because this is a respiratory disease, so we've got cough, chest pain, they're going to be coughing up bloody sputum, and then there's going to be some weakness and fatigue and some weight loss because of the energy expenditure required to be able to breathe. And then the treatment for this is actually six to nine months of antibiotics. So this is a very long one. If you reflect back on some of the classes that you've taken, microbiology, this bacteria actually grows very, very slowly. So bacteria is only affected by antibiotics at a certain point in the life cycle. And because this antibiotic or this bacteria grows so slowly, it's only affected by the antibiotics at a very small window. And in order to be able to catch all of the bacteria that could be in the lungs, you have to take the antibiotic for a very long time, six to nine months. This is the part where the public health nurse has to come in and be like following up on this because it's really hard for people to be consistent to take antibiotics for such a long period of time, especially because antibiotics can have such negative side effects like upset, upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those kinds of things. So people will want to stop taking this medication, but it's really important that they continue it in order to fully get rid of the tuberculosis. Legionnaire's disease, I included this one in here. This one actually is not communicable in that it cannot go from a person to a person, but it's found often in the community, so I decided to include it inside this lecture. This is bacteria that's found naturally in lakes and streams, and it becomes a problem when it spreads to man-made water systems like hot tubs, hot water tanks, and plumbing systems. So it's Legionnaire's disease, or there's another one called Pontiac fever, which is spread in those droplets. So if those droplets get small enough to be inhaled in some way or another, like in a hot tub where you've got all that steam coming off, it can also get into the lungs via aspiration. If you're like in a lake and you were water skiing or something like that and inhaled some water, but that's a little bit less common. Uh, Pontiac fever actually goes away on its own, but Legionnaire's disease requires antibiotics. So because this is a respiratory thing, you're going to see the same symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, fever, muscle aches, and headaches. And then it is foodborne because it's in contaminated water and preventing it is going to be maintaining that water and the treatment, again, like I said, is antibiotics. Lyme disease as well is not communicable, but it's found pretty common in the in the community. So it's important for the community health centers to understand and educate about this. Depending on the area that you're in, you might have lots of ticks. Now this is, this comes as a vector borne from ticks and the prevention here is going to be preventing tick bites. So as a community health nurse, you're going to look at educating people on how to do that, such as wearing long sleeves and pants when they're in areas out hiking or camping. And then you can also treat those clothes with something called uh, permethrin or using bug spray as well. Uh, this is actually really interesting because it's got a uh, fever headache and fatigue, but then you get this really characteristic rash that looks like a bullseye. Uh, that's very characteristic of Lyme's disease. And then as well, you're going to get uh, some facial palsy, maybe heart palpitations and some nerve pain. And this is also treated with antibiotics. All right, just a quick review. A communicable disease is a disease that can be spread from one person to another. 
The community health nursing goal is to reduce that spread. And then the three types of prevention are primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary being we're catching it before the person even gets the disease. Secondary, we're catching it before that person has signs and symptoms of the disease. And third is that the person already has the disease, but we're going to do our best to reduce the long-term side effects of that disease. Thanks for tuning in. Please help me grow my channel by clicking subscribe and follow below. 